this is your identity at this point. Yeah. You know, yeah. You're Raj. Yeah. <laughs> from right. With, you know, from yeah. what's happening. Right. And now you're canceled. Yeah. And you went into a depression over that. Oh, yeah. Partying, yeah. celebrities are coming over. And then in 1979, the show gets canceled. And you didn't even know it was coming. No. Found out from a newsstand guy. 1979, the show gets canceled. And you didn't even know it was coming. No. Found out from a newsstand guy. Major depression. More <laughs> goes I haven't introduced the coca. So there's been a lot of buzz lately about Ernest Lee Thomas spilling the beans on his mental health battles. It's got everyone talking online and it's making folks wonder if Hollywood is even more messed up than we thought. Word on the street is that like many other black artists, Ernest might have faced some serious heat, even survived some kind of attack. To figure out what really went down with Ernest, we got a rewind to the beginning of his journey. The angelic and you have this euphoria, like, oh my God, I want to feel this way all my life. But then that downside, then the devil come, yes. right? And every thought, every evil thought, everything. Ernest Lee Thomas, renowned for his iconic role in the 70s smash sitcom What's Happening, has seen it all in Hollywood. Riding high on the show's success, he reveled in the perks of fame and fortune, enjoying the spotlight as a beloved figure. But when the sitcom ended, Thomas encountered a rough patch, grappling with regrettable choices that set him on a rocky road to redemption. Everything that bothered you, every childhood memory, <laughs> everything everyone said to you comes up huh. and you feel less than crap. Becoming a notable presence in the mid-70s, this star shot into the limelight with his debut in the 1974 Broadway show Love for Love. But before hitting that milestone, he put in the hard work, refining his craft at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. With dreams of a full-time acting career, he packed his bags and headed to Los Angeles. Oh, and real quick, because you know Father's Day is coming up. Yes. And this is Los Angeles Sentinel TV. Oh. Quickly established his presence, the actor landed a role on The Jeffersons as Ronnie Walker, followed by a memorable appearance on the 1975 hit series Beretta. These gigs set the stage for his involvement in The Brady Bunch Hour that same year. And this oh, is... Oh. Excuse me. I'll take it from here. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bobby Brady. But Thomas didn't stop there. He made waves in the movie scene too, with standout performances in various roles. From portraying Kailuba in the miniseries Roots to Mr. Omar in Everybody Hates Chris, Lenny in Basketball Girlfriend, and Sydney in Malcolm X, his filmography is as diverse as it is impressive. Interestingly, Thomas was initially in the running for the lead role of Kunta Kinte in Roots, but fate led him to embrace the character of Kailuba after missing out on the lead. <laughs> Ernest Thomas undeniably made his mark in various movie roles, but his most iconic portrayal remains that of Roger Raj Thomas on What's Happening, and its sequel, What's Happening Now. These TV series not only showcased Thomas's acting chops, but also cemented his status as a beloved sitcom figure. What's interesting is how Thomas stumbled upon the opportunity. While on the set of The Jeffersons, Mary White, agent to Isabel Sanford, aka Louise Jefferson, played a crucial role in nudging Thomas to audition for the new pilot. Thomas reminisces, My first sitcom was The Jeffersons, and she was loving what I was doing as a guest star. She came over and told me, There's a new pilot called Cooley High, and I think you'd be perfect for it. I had an agent already, so I thanked her and told her I'd tell my agent. When I did, he got all upset, asking, Who in the hell is she to tell you about this show? Despite the initial skepticism, Thomas went for the audition and landed the role, paving the way for his iconic portrayal as Roger Raj Thomas. This role was a game changer for him. Him, propelling him into stardom. And Ernest hasn't been shy about sharing the ups and downs of his journey to snagging this breakthrough and the sacrifices it demanded. He once spilled, I lost a few buddies when I snagged the role of Raj because everyone wanted to be Raj. I went up against over 200 actors at auditions. Facing countless callbacks and grueling screen tests, Thomas eventually clinched the coveted role. He chalks it up to what he sees as a higher power at work, shaped by his prayers and unshakable faith. You know, because I just knew this was going to be a hit, but they said it wasn't funny enough. It was a um, one camera, you know, and uh, they had uh, the original guy. Taking on the role of Raj at just 26, Thomas shattered age barriers as he quickly rose to fame. The show struck gold, becoming an instant hit and propelling him to stardom during its run from 1976 to 1979. Playing a pivotal character, Thomas effortlessly captured the hearts of fans, becoming a beloved figure. The show's success not only earned him widespread acclaim, but also considerable wealth and prosperity, marking a remarkable achievement for the young actor at the time. And then later they called and said, well, you know, we're going to do a three camera. We're going to keep you 
get rid of everybody else and cast another uh, group around. Continuing his journey with the iconic character, Thomas reprised the role in the sequel, What's Happening Now, which hit screens again in 1985 after a six-year break, extending his bond with the beloved character for another three years. However, it wasn't all smooth sailing. With fame and wealth came the weighty challenges of managing it all, especially at a relatively young age. When What's Happening wrapped up, Thomas found himself grappling with the aftermath. His path took a darker turn, influenced by a series of questionable life choices yeah major depression more because i haven't introduced the coke at that time and remy martin so those were the go-to you know and of course the abrupt cancellation of the show came as an unexpected blow for thomas who revealed that he learned about it not through official channels but from a newsstand vendor this moment of sudden realization had a profound impact on him shaping the trajectory of his life in the years that followed he said all that was required was deciding to trust in god and establishing a personal relationship with him thomas openly acknowledged experiencing a period of depression following the disheartening revelation about the show's cancellation which unfortunately led him into the grips of substance abuse he grappled with addiction to illicit substances such as C, crack, and M. And crack. Yeah, which came in the 80s, though. So. Uh -huh. Yeah, that came in the 80s, yeah. Okay. Well, actually, like the end, like, like 1980. Like 70. Looking back on his struggle with substance abuse, Thomas openly admitted that, at first, it brought about a powerful and euphoric rush. Yet, he didn't shy away from acknowledging the flip side of the coin. After the high wore off, he found himself plunged into darkness. The allure of the substances led to encounters with sinister thoughts, leaving him with a pervasive sense of inadequacy and negativity. And you have this euphoria, like, oh my God, I want to feel this way all my life. But then that downside, then the the devil comes, yeah. right? And every thought, every... Initially, the star tried to set boundaries on his substance use, but as time went on, things took a darker turn, pushing him to realize the urgent need to break free from the grip of addiction. The wake-up call hit Thomas hard when he faced eviction from his home, having drained all his financial resources and unable to keep up with rent. It was a harsh reality check. In the aftermath, he found refuge by moving in with his sister, who, despite his financial struggles, welcomed him with open arms. This moment became became a pivotal turning point in his life, pushing him towards the realization that change was not just necessary, but imperative. Hey, you're my son now, come on over, you know? But I was smart enough not to come over because I knew being a millionaire, I would end up dead there. With a fierce determination driving him forward, Thomas embarked on a journey to liberate himself from his addiction by reconnecting with his Muslim roots. He turned to prayer, earnestly seeking divine intervention to help him overcome his struggles. A crucial turning point in his journey came when his cousin introduced him to a Muslim acquaintance. Through candid conversations with this individual, Thomas found guidance and influence that played a pivotal role in motivating him to pursue a clean and sober lifestyle. My cousin brought this Muslim guy over and and uh, I needed something. You know, as Christians would say, well, why didn't you? I said, you guys are too busy getting high to talk about Christ. <laughs> and my Jewish producer. The actor from Funny People has been upfront about his profound faith, which dates back to 1975 when he formed a personal bond with God and embraced Islam. He credits every achievement in his life to God, whom he holds above all else. Despite his openness about his faith, there have been speculations from some quarters that he converted due to the perceived negative effects of the show. But that have been done already. But I'm telling everyone, that's my part. That was my part. As God would have it, you know, uh, I happened to go at that time. Having navigated through the trials and tribulations of his journey, Thomas now devotes himself to spreading a message of universal love from God. He firmly believes that God's love extends to everyone equally and is ready to work miracles in their lives. In his own journey of faith, Thomas discovered that all it took was a decision to trust in God and cultivate a personal relationship with Him. Inspired by his profound experiences, he penned the book From Raj to Riches, Overcoming Life Through Faith. Through this book, Thomas aims to motivate and uplift others, urging them to prioritize their connection with God. He believes that by placing God at the forefront, even in the complexities of showbiz, everything else will fall into place. The book stands as a testament to his unwavering faith in the transformative power of belief and its ability to guide individuals through life's toughest challenges. Moreover, Thomas was also up against 200 actors for the part. They were looking at, I would say, at least 200 people, Thomas recalls of the audition process 
which lasted several weeks. The days dragged on as Thomas awaited the final verdict. Those sleepless nights were not cutting it at all, he says with a laugh. I was so frustrated. It was like, make a choice. I won't be mad if it's not me, because at least then I know. It did not stop here. He also claimed that the show was a racist. It was definitely a positive. Ernest Thomas, who played lead character Roger Thomas, told Today, I think a supernatural positive effect because of the absence of blacks on television. Even though Good Times was out there and Jefferson's and Sanford and Son were on, it wasn't the youth. What's happening? Was these three teenagers, which I think had an impact on all cultures, so that everybody can identify with friends, teenage friends. The comedy series featured a lineup of strong and unforgettable characters, each leaving a lasting impression. There was Roger, alongside his bashful buddy Dwayne, played by Haywood Nelson and Rerun, brought to life by Fred Berry, their endearingly dense yet lovable and portly companion. Roger's sister Dee, portrayed by Danielle Spencer, brought a dose of sibling rivalry into the mix, always nudging her brother for spare change, while their industrious single mother, played by Mabel King, stood as the family's moral compass. Hey, Raj, how you doing? Hey, Raj, what's happening? Mm, smells like they're already happy. The group of friends frequently gathered at the soda shop, where the wise-cracking waitress Shirley engaged in banter with the customers. The humor often included fast and furious fat jokes, raising questions about their appropriateness in today's context. Inspired by the 1975 film Cooley High, What's Happening? transcended racial boundaries and resonated with a diverse audience. Thomas believes that beyond providing laughs, the sitcom had a broader impact, connecting with people from all backgrounds over the years. It also helped with race relations, he said. I've talked to white folks over the years that hated black folks. I mean, goodness, they hated them, and their folks were that way. But as a child, when the folks were gone, they'd be channel surfing, right? And stumble over, what's happening? And find themselves staying there, and next thing you know, they're laughing, but they go, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to laugh. It chipped away the racism, he added, despite not reaching the heights of rating success. What's happening? Thrived on the undeniable chemistry among its cast. Roger, known for his hilariously awful dance moves, infectious laugh, and tendency to mumble when in trouble, stood out as a distinct character. Rerun, sporting his iconic suspenders and beret, wowed audiences with his signature dance moves, while Dwayne's catchphrase, hey, 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 and his disapproving, nuh uh, added to the show's charm. From day one of working together, Thomas sensed something special. I swear, man, it was like an out of body experience, he reflected. I don't know these people, but as soon as I walked in that room, man, it was a thing that I can't explain. They gave me chills. It's like we know each other already. The series took a fresh turn as Roger and Rerin moved into their own apartment, introducing new characters like the white father-son duo of Big Earl and Little Earl, with the latter harboring a crush on Dee. I think they found it amusing, Thomas remarked about the show's audience. You know, you're not thinking about it because it's a little kid. As far as interracial relations, I think it really helped. Thomas also holds firm to the belief that the series played a pivotal role in paving the way for other black centered comedies in the 80s, such as The Cosby Show and 227. He attributes the cancellation of the series to tensions between Fred Berry and the show's producers. According to Thomas, the breaking point occurred when Berry accused the producers of racism. This accusation, Thomas suggests, ultimately led to the show's cancellation, despite his belief that it could have continued. When asked about his favorite episode, Thomas didn't hesitate to respond. The two-part Doobie Brothers, hands down, he said, referring to the memorable episode in which the band performs a concert at the Friends High School, the same school they supposedly attended, and Rerun agrees to secretly record it in exchange for good tickets. It really set us apart from all the other shows, Thomas said, while adding that the members of the band were really good guys. In a standout episode, Roger makes a memorable attempt to locate a band at their hotel by cleverly asking, which doobie you be? When someone picks up, a line that has become iconic and left a lasting impact. Even though the show wrapped up in 1979, its charm only seemed to grow with time, especially through syndication, which kicked off as early as 1980. What's happening? Found a fresh and dedicated audience. But then the show became more popular in reruns than on primetime, Thomas remarked. Who knew? 69 episodes, actually 65. The phenomenon of what's happening is most of these shows like Good Times and All in the Family, they got 100, 200 shows. It was only 69 episodes that people ate like popcorn. This resurgence paved the way for something virtually unheard of at the time, a reboot. After the show's cancellation, Thomas found himself inundated with fans at concerts, sparking an idea for a revival. You see photo, photos of it now on, on the internet. Uh, so that failed. 
So that was a disappointment. That's when I thought, well, well, maybe I was wrong. Despite facing disinterest from his former co-stars, writers, and even his manager, Thomas found an unexpected ally in Muhammad Ali, who happened to be a fan of the original series. Encouraged by Ali's words, Thomas felt inspired to press on. When I met Muhammad Ali, I was telling him about it, and he says, look, instead of complaining, just go to them. Go to the studio and tell them, Thomas recalled. Taking Ali's advice to heart, he did just that. Though initially met with rejection, Thomas's persistence eventually paid off. Executives came to recognize the enduring popularity of the reruns, which paved the way for what's happening now. Making its mark as one of the first reboots in TV history, the show premiered in 1985 and enjoyed a successful three-season run. In the original plan for the reboot, Thomas envisioned Roger and Shirley being married, but that idea got scrapped eventually. He also disclosed that Vanessa Williams was initially slated to play his wife, Nadine, but lost the role due to the release of nude photos in 1984 after she was crowned Miss America. Despite these alterations, Thomas expressed satisfaction with the reboot, which notably introduced an unknown comedian named Martin Lawrence to the TV scene when he joined the series in 1987. Martin Lawrence, widely celebrated for his comedic prowess, is often hailed as a trailblazer in the field. However, Ernest Lee Thomas presents a contrasting viewpoint, describing Lawrence as more than just a funny man, someone with an alleged air of arrogance. Thomas candidly shared intriguing facets of his interactions with fellow actor Martin Lawrence, offering a distinctive perspective on the entertainment industry. He delved into the dynamics between them, touching on themes of fame, ego, and personal struggles. Yeah, he did get a start on what's happening. Who knew, you know? Uh... But, and I was, you know, I, I accepted him with open arms because, you know, the other cast members didn't want him on the show. To start, Ernest Thomas reflected on Martin Lawrence's early steps into the entertainment world. Thomas acknowledged that Lawrence's first big break came on What's Happening, a fact that hadn't received much attention before. He had just done uh, Star Search, but he didn't win. He didn't win Star Search. So his, his first professional gig was What's Happening. Okay. Now. Thomas recounted the tale of extending a warm welcome to Lawrence, despite facing opposition from other cast members. He hinted at Lawrence's undeniable comedic gift, which made Thomas's decision to support him almost instinctual. But I, I was there with him when he was turned down by the uh, comedy store three times. Yeah, but that was it. He got his start on there. In that era, Martin Lawrence emerged as a promising star bursting with potential. His magnetic charisma and undeniable talent swiftly captured the attention of those around him, including Ernest Lee Thomas. The atmosphere on the set of What's Happening Now was electrified with camaraderie, and Lawrence's humor and vibrant energy injected new vitality into the show. However, as Martin Lawrence's career soared to new heights, noticeable transformations unfolded. Thomas adeptly portrayed how Lawrence's demeanor underwent a discernible shift, a metamorphosis marked by a growing sense of arrogance and an increasingly widening disconnect from reality. This evolution became more apparent as Lawrence climbed the ladder of fame and success. With each step upward, Lawrence delved deeper into the realm of celebrity. You know, and it wasn't like he was, oh, he was just incredibly funny. You know, you know, now, of course, I love the Martin show, but he yeah. just, it, it wasn't there. The weight of fame, the relentless demands of the industry, and the tempting allure of the spotlight evidently influenced Martin Lawrence's personality. Once a humble and motivated young artist, he now showed signs of conceit and self-importance. Ernest shared a compelling anecdote about a missed chance to collaborate with Lawrence. He described how Lawrence, to Thomas's surprise and disappointment, turned down a lucrative offer for a film project. And not only did he not talk, he could at least call me himself and said, no, you got the agent calling me. Ernest went further to explain the incident, saying, We made the offer. We had offered him $500,000 for 13 days. Never heard from the agent after that. This incident served as a glaring example of how success can sometimes sever the connections between celebrities and their roots. The missed opportunity became a poignant reminder of how fame's alluring charm can cloud one's judgment. Lawrence's choice to reject the offer had consequences that extended beyond the immediate project, reflecting a broader transformation in his priorities and a distorted perception of his value in the industry. Fans are convinced that there might be some truth in Ernest's claims of Lawrence being blinded by fame. One of them wrote, Love this man for how he tells his story with no judgments, resentment, anger, or force. Pure and easy. This is his journey with all the bad and the good. Incredible life, very touching. God carries him. 
Another one added, Ernest is an intelligent college educated man with unfortunate life experiences. Who knew? He still looks good and his voice didn't age either. He sounds the same. One person added, Ernest needs to consider doing motivational podcasts for these young kids doing all these horrific D. He's been clean 30 years plus his calm, non-judgmental voice can change the direction of some of these young ones. With the passing of Barry Hemphill and King, Thomas marvels at how the series continues to resonate. He has encountered military personnel who find solace in watching episodes on military bases, showcasing the enduring influence of the show. Additionally, attending a pop culture convention revealed the show's ability to break down color barriers, leaving a lasting impression on fans. The first time we went there, we could not believe the line. We see all these lines of white people, he said. And I said, oh, somebody was really popular. And so one of the people working there said, they're waiting on you. They're waiting to get in to meet you. We could not believe it. Not only did Thomas face challenges due to the show, but another actor also also went through a similar experience, Fred Berry. Fred Berry remains a definitive example of an actor forever tied to a particular role. His portrayal of the beret and suspenders clad, constantly dancing Freddie Stubbs, aka Rerun, on the 1976 to 1979 teen sitcom, What's Happening? Berry not only accepted but also capitalized on the inevitability of being forever known as Fred Rerun Berry. Following the show, the majority of his post, What's Happening? roles were either reprisals of the character or cameos as himself. But, you know, one of the standouts was Fred Berry. Oh, yeah. AKA Rerun. Yes. Now, Fred kind of had an interesting background before joining the show. Yeah. However, the weight of being rerun took its toll on Barry. Despite becoming a millionaire by the age of 29, he struggled with the stress of success, leading him into a downward spiral of DNA. This decade-long addiction resulted in three S attempts. Eventually, Barry found sobriety in 1985 and later went on to become a Christian minister, marking a transformative chapter in his life. He said, I was a millionaire by the time I was 29, he told people in 19. 96, the stress of success got to me, and I got heavily into DNA. I was empty inside. Fred Berry's romantic life became notably complicated in the aftermath of his television success. Before his death in 2003 at the age of 52, Berry went through a total of six marriages, involving four different women, with two of his spouses marrying him twice. Despite the public scrutiny surrounding his personal life, Berry chose not to publicly disclose the identity of his estranged sixth wife. In response to inquiries about this particular marriage, Barry stated, She's been trying to get her 15 minutes of fame from me off of my name and my career ever since we got married. I don't want to give her that pleasure, as reported by People. The actor's personal struggles and complex relationships added another layer to his post, What's happening? Experiences. Married six times to four different women, Barry knew both the ups and downs of life, riding high on his earnings from What's Happening, but crashing to earth when the show ended in 1979. He freely admitted that when he was at his top, it sort of went to his head, the Hollywood lifestyle, Shelton said. He told me that in an eight-month span, he blew $1 million on D in gambling. But in later years, he used that when speaking to school children. He was really motivated in trying to help kids, telling them not to do like he did. When the income from his acting career dwindled, Fred Berry's life took a downward spiral. Despite his talents, Berry found himself typecast as Rerun, the cheerful beret-wearing breakdancer from What's Happening, which made it challenging for him to secure roles outside of this character. In the East Coast, the guys were more acrobatic right, and did right, a lot more floor work. Right. In LA, in the West Coast, they are more kind of with the hand motions yeah. and the you know, that type. According to Shelton, a friend of Barry's, the actor grappled with overcoming the rerun stereotype, finding a sense of acceptance in doing so. In later years, he began to experience a resurgence, staging a comeback as rerun. Appearances on shows like Scrubs and Dickie Roberts brought him immense joy as he felt he was granted a second chance at stardom. This comeback marked a positive turn in Barry's career, bringing him renewed satisfaction and recognition. And it really came from him. Yeah. He was the one that really invented a lot of that. Fred Berry's ex-manager had penned a script for What's Happening, the movie, and Berry was actively shopping it around Hollywood. Additionally, he was working on an autobiography titled Tears of a Clown, the rerun Berry story, with the assistance of his friend Shelton. However, tragedy struck when Berry suffered a stroke. Although his speech remained intact, the stroke significantly impacted his motor skills. This turn of events was particularly poignant for Barry, who, as one of the pioneers of breakdancing, suddenly found himself unable to walk without a cane. He was actually part of a, what I would call a breakdancing group yeah. called The Lockers. The Lockers, yeah. And, you know, as yeah. someone who was breakdancing, 
you know, in the 80s. Despite the challenges, Barry maintained an optimistic and upbeat outlook, reminiscent of his character Rerin, until the day he passed away. Shelton recalled Barry's positive attitude, mentioning that he kept saying, oh, I'll be all right, I'll be dancing in a couple of months. This resilience and spirit defined Barry's approach to life, even in the face of adversity. One of his fans wrote, I miss Fred Barry. He was a talented character actor and dancer, very light on his feet. I remember he got his start on Soul Train. A lot of talent came off that show, RIP rerun. The revelations indeed shed light on the challenges faced not just by Ernest Thomas, but also by his fellow actors in the industry. Despite being admired for their acting skills, their lives behind the scenes appear to be far from easy. It's a reminder that the glitz and glamour of Hollywood often mask the struggles and difficulties that many actors face. It's essential to recognize the human side of these performers and the hurdles they navigate in their personal lives amidst their professional success. That's it for today. See you in the next video. Until then, goodbye.